So the following Sunday, I, I said, you know, I, I kind of changed my mind. <laughs> yeah, and I'd like to know if you'd like to go out with me. She said, well, how about we come to a happy medium and I'll make you a nice dinner. All right. And that made me happy to have somebody cook dinner for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I went and she fixed me the biggest dinner you could ever possibly imagine and fixed my favorite dessert and uh, and then there was music on, and I'm, uh, I asked her if she wanted to dance. She said, well, I don't dance. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you're going to now. <laughs> and we did. And from that moment on, we were never apart. So how would you describe in general being gay, not only at Muncie Community Schools, but at all the places you've worked as a teacher? I think, I think being any kind of minority comes with this discovery of being proud that you are one, right? I think history and the system conditions you to hate it, to suppress you. Uh, but through that suppression, comes a sense of pride of getting through it, right? And you know this, I mean, anything worth doing is hard, but once you get through it, you are much more proud of yourself for getting through it. And I think for a lot of people, particularly black folks too, we have a sense of pride because we know the history that is there. We know the university we still have to go through now, but yet we still stand. How can you not be proud of that, about who you are as a person, as a people, right? And so being a gay man, understanding the long arc of, arc of our history and how far we've come, you can't help but be proud about that. So in school, I'm open, I'm out, I have no shame in, in that as much as I have no shame in being Black. And I have no problem supporting students and staff who are in my group and category who need that level of su support. Um, and you get a sense of that you have to be that, that person, right? Like when I teach, I'm very protective of my black and brown students. I'm very protective of my gay, trans and lesbian uh, students because I might be the only voice that they have who is their voice and can kind of push that. So. I'm extremely proud to be in any position that I'm in. Is there anyone that you know, personally or otherwise, that you're not out to? I wouldn't say that I'm afraid to tell that information to anyone because mm. I think that obviously if it was 20 years ago, it would be a different story. But in this day and age, it's just a fact that I have a wife. And if anyone has shit to say about it, then quite frankly, I don't give a damn. <laughs> yeah. Moved to Atlanta in 1979 and lived in Atlanta for 40 years and just recently moved to Tarpon Springs, Florida. I did my first gay pride march in 1980 and at that time there were only a couple hundred people in the parade and today in Atlanta the gay pride march draws over 300,000 people in attendance throughout the parade and uh, to the park and the festivities, and it's the longest running parade in the city of Atlanta today. Well, whether or not she goes, she knows it. You are a very, very wonderful daughter to her. Thank you. You know, that's the first time anyone's ever called me her daughter. I think um, gay marriage is probably one of the biggest things that's happened to. LGBT people, at least in my lifetime, I think it's the biggest thing that's happened. It brought, um, you know, homosexuality to the, um, to the public eye in a way that was positive, um, objectively positive, I'd say, the, you know, the legalization of homosexual marriage. And I think that did a lot for normalizing it amongst a lot of people. Obviously, it's not perfect, and there are still issues in our country related to it, Supreme Court, I'm looking at you, but um, 
it, it did a lot. And I think throughout my life, it's probably done the most at a legal level. From a cultural perspective, I think throughout my life, we've just seen more visibility of, of LGBT people um, and more, most recently, um, transgender people in media. Um, and I think that's done a lot of the same thing. It's helped normalize the LGBT community as you know, a legitimate group of people that live in our society and you know aren't these social outcasts that i think some people see them as there would be occasionally someone you know you have these three issues you talk about and then you ask well do you have any issues you think are really important and i know there have been some doors where i've been asked what's your view on gay rights and you know at I would tell them, you know, I'm supportive. <laughs> and you could just see a look of relief in their faces. So there, I mean, people know it's, it's tough <laughs> being different, but maybe it's not as tough as it used to be. I don't think it is. When the Supreme Court ruled, you know, in favor of gay marriage, that was one of the big things that was like, love wins. And, you know, I was like, yes, it does. Uh, that's great. So I, re I remember where I was when I read that that um, happened. It was a very, very exciting time. We realized my kid was gay when he was 12 and he was feeling isolated and he felt like he um, was all alone. And so to help him feel less isolated and find his tribe, my husband and I would drive him to Indianapolis every Friday to IYG, Indiana Youth Group. And we would, we would leave him there so he could make friends and we could really see the difference in him. It, it changed his uh, confidence and it really helped him a lot to find peers. To see queer people that exist and just like are fine with it and are comfortable with themselves. Um, I'm like tearing up a little bit, but it was like, it meant a lot to me. And I felt like that entire like board was special to me um, and how they and like invited me in and constantly invited me to the table. Um, so then having the opportunity to be elected secretary, like I had to go through that interview process with all of them. And like, I was like, I'm not going to get it because I'm super painfully shy and I'm too anxious and stuff like that. But I ended up getting elected, um, and getting that leadership position my freshman year, which again, pushed me to be responsible for things and like help, um, put on spectrum and, Again, just even that opportunity and the fact that they believed in me was a lot. And like, they advocated for me. When we did um, uh, our co-sponsored event, I remember at the end of it, um, it was, we tried to like, you know, keep everybody together and like work together. But at the end of the event, the Black Student Union kids were like standing at the back of the hall and the Spectrum kids were standing at the front of the hall. And I'm pretty sure we were singing a song from Rent, but... <laughs> But we were just like, you know, going wild and having a good time. And I was, it, it seemed kind of indicative to me about like, you know, just the freedom that the Spectrum group had uh, just to, you know, do what you wanted and be who you wanted to be. That was, I don't know, just important to me. So how do you think, what would you think educators should do to create a more safe space for um, LGBTQ students? Let them be who they are. And I think that's easy because that means you don't have to agree. You know, I think sometimes people think it's a it's an either or proposition, right? That if you happen to be a, a teacher who's more conservative or more religious, um, that you somehow have to betray your own personal values um, to accept a gay student, which you you don't. I'm not asking you to change anything about. Your, per, your point of view. What I'm asking you to do is let that student be who they are openly and honestly. 
right? If you can at least provide them that much space, you're doing a whole lot more than others do. And that does not require that you change your personal viewpoint. Just don't suppress or stifle someone else's light. Um, you know, I think that's the best advice I can give to anybody because I don't want people to change their personal view, but I also don't want their personal view to dim the light of someone else. What I find is though that there are people who are warm and welcoming. At that time, I thought I could only find it on the West Coast, but I'm saying to those people, as warm and inviting as they are, no, I, I am farm bred and farm born and I, this is where I want to be. Um, this is, I, I don't want to, I don't want to hear that I have to leave the Midwest in order to find life. I'm not willing to do that. My, my sense of identity, as much as I can say I'm a gay man, I can also say I am a country bumpkin. I, am, I, find my, I don't find it nurturing. And at that point in my life, I was try, trying to put things together that were nurturing, that would give me life. Uh, and I wanted, in the, I know the rural life does that for me, the being in touch with nature, having nature at my fingertips, uh, and what that means for me, and the the rhythm of life, the seasons, the movement of the seasons, the, the change of crops in the farmyards around us, the wild animals that come, the not so wild animals, the chickens that have nurtured me all my life. I want to be able to be in touch with those people, or with those, yeah, those people, those forces, those energies, um, all that they have to offer me, and I don't want to have to give that up in order to be gay. I don't want to have to say, oh, I have to live in downtown Muncie. I have to live in downtown Indianapolis in order to be gay. I, I resist that not willing to go there. Yeah, so there's a, there's a pride, there's a rural pride too that says, it's okay, there, there's a place for, for gay farm boys. Um, and whether we're visible or not, whether people recognize that or not, we're here. Yeah. And I'm curious with that, have you seen a change in how people identify since when you started outreach? Oh, definitely, definitely. When we started, we were all gay boys and that was about it. And now we are a mixture of, of kids who are um, gender fluid or transgender. And we have a lot of kids who are asexual, which to me is very brave to come out in a world where uh, people are pressured to be sexual or pressured to be sexy. To come out as a teenager as asexual is just so remarkable to me and brave. So we have a big variety of kids right now, and they're all trying on different labels and trying to see what works for them, trying to, to find a good fit. In um, the um, activism role, because you were a straight ally, did you ever receive a reaction because of that, or were people fine with it? No, I did not because uh, previous or we had another uh, straight president previous to me um and i i can see her face right now i cannot remember her name <laughs> um but that that's basically what kind of drove me to go for the president uh position as well just because i knew that this was a place where it would be okay um so that's where i mean i never got any backlash for it um the only real trouble I had was I probably broke a lot of lesbians' hearts because they always thought I was part of the Q questioning. So, <laughs> sorry, ladies. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was, that was really, um, I really didn't find any problem, you know, becoming part of this organization, part of the community. Education is vital because if you, just like kids with binders, um, if you don't have the correct information, you could break a rib or really hurt yourself. So they don't, that's not something you're going to a teacher and ask and you're not asking your mom about. So there's, there's different education uh, levels that we have to look at for each kid. Yes. And this was a question for myself. Can you define binders for people who don't know? Uh huh. Um, the binders, I'm talking about chest binders and uh, transgender boys may have body dysphoria about having breast. And so because they hate 
that so much they will bind to flatten their chest more. Uh, we had a kid use ACE bandages and uh, broke a rib, which made us decide that we were going to start giving away binders. So kids who come to us, we give them binders and teach them safety of how to wear them properly, how long to wear them, because it can hurt you. I still have my queer friends who understand my struggle and having to come out and um, how my parents took it and just like dating life in general, even though I have a boyfriend at the moment, they still do understand each other. And my community doesn't necessarily mean that being queer is the main thing of my group. It's more or less, you are my friend. I very much love you in my life. And um being queer is not the number one thing about you. Yes, it is a part of me. And yes, it is a part of you, but we don't make it our whole personality. So my community is just, we are who we are. But transgender lives, I think are like my number one thing currently that like, if that comes up or something comes up with that, like, I know I'm a journalist, I'm not supposed to be doing that stuff, but that is something I will stand up for. Just because, yeah. you know, as someone who's a part of the community, I feel like this is, we have to look out for each other. Since I've been in Muncie, I would say this has been a good place. Um, we've um, always felt like if you were a good neighbor, nobody cared whether you're gay or straight. When we realized that my kid was gay, um, we were not prepared for it, even though it was right in front of us. And my husband was even less prepared for it than I was. So we didn't want to talk to people we knew because my kid was 12 and I felt like I needed to keep him safe. I was worried. So um, we went to Peep Black in Indianapolis, which is parents and friends of lesbians and gays. And it was very helpful to talk to strangers about what we were going through uh, because it felt safe. You know, if I talk to a stranger, they're not gonna call my sister and say, well, Laura said. So um, we offer that here too, because sometimes as a parent, especially when you're thinking with the heterosexual brain, you're not prepared to have a, a gay kid. And you might have a freak out moment, which is natural, and we would prefer parents come to us and freak out and not freak out in front of their kid. But really the stuff that I've been involved in in terms of like queer experiences and everything here is like all of my friends are queer. <laughs> <laughs> like I have maybe two straight friends um, and that's it. Um, and so I just am constantly surrounded by queer people, which is, I know, not like a normal thing for a lot of people. I sometimes actually forget <laughs> that I'm surrounded by like almost only queer people um, in my day to day life and that not everybody is queer, which is, I think, something that's actually really fun because that's not something I like grew up in. And so it's nice to have almost everybody around you that's similar in that regard. Well, for me, it's just the impact of the kids. Every time I, I deal with kids that come in with a crisis and then they do okay, um, are the kids that are brave enough to um, act out on something. We had a kid at Gorktown that started the GSA and came and worked with Yorktown to create a bathroom that was gender neutral. Um, I had a kid that came into me at the age of 13 after a suicide attempt. And the only thing he wanted from us was to know he was gonna to live to be 21. And just by spending time with other people like himself, I mean, we didn't work any magic, we didn't do anything, but just by being there, you could see the change in him, you know, now he's planning for college and he's making plans for the future. So I just think it helps 
tremendously just to find people like you. How do you personally identify? Sure. And I think that's something that's changed in the last maybe year or so too, maybe a little bit more. The, the main thing I will always say is I'm queer. I, I believe in the word queer uh, a lot. Um, I believe in it in uh, so many different ways. <clears throat> I would never put that word on somebody if they don't believe in it or if they don't feel right with it. So I won't say, well, you're just queer. I would never do that. Um, but I identify as a bisexual woman. But I also feel really strong with the label of demisexual as well. Um, but I don't go into those particular labels until a second round of questioning is asked. Because the main thing I want to say is that I am queer. Um, because I do think <clears throat> it's important for me to understand my own identity and know how I'm going to navigate the world and see the world. Um, so the terms bisexual and demisexual matter to me a little bit. But in terms of um, how do I fit in society? I just want to stick with the word queer because I think the more we split up our otherness, we're fighting for scraps. And I think the more we, we can unite in our otherness, it's better. And so one day after like a few months, I was just really tired of it. And I came out to my dad and I thought it was going to be a really big deal because he had made certain comments before, but I told him and he was like, yeah, I know. And I was like sobbing. And I was like, wait, what, what do you mean, you know? And he was like, well, you don't really talk about guys that much. I was like, well, yeah, but you always say you're going to like shoot them. If I talk about a guy, I like, why would I talk about guys in front of you? I still like guys. And he was like, nah, I just knew it's all, it's all good. And I was like, I just made this a really big deal for nothing. He goes, yeah, you're crying an awfully lot. <laughs> I was like, Thanks, dad. So my dad does not care, um, which is very, very nice. He stopped making comments towards me. It's not something we talk about, but I think as long as I'm happy, he's happy. That's kind of how it worked out. And there was a couple on that show, Callie in Arizona, and I remember watching them be two women who were together and thinking that I wanted to do that. And I remember one day mom and I were putting up Christmas decorations and I was really grumpy and she wanted to know why I was so grumpy because usually I'm not that grumpy. And she's like, what's wrong, Rose, what's wrong? And so we sat down in the dining room <clears throat> and she, I remember it clear as day. And she said, uh, Rosie, what's wrong? And I cried for like 20 minutes before I even said anything. I was like, mom, you know what Grey's Anatomy when Callie kisses Arizona? And she's like, yeah, Rose, I think I want to kiss girls, too. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> so when I came out, uh, <laughs> the show Glee uh, was still on air. And Santana Lopez, played by the late uh, Naya Rivera, um, she came it was her like coming out episodes and i just remember thinking if somebody as badass as santana can do this like i can do this like we could i'm like not anywhere near as cool as santana was but um i thought yeah i can do this i want to do it i see i can i can she can do it so i'm gonna do it like it was it was a thing and then obviously when i came out to you harrison i remember we were sitting on the back patio we were sitting at the table and i was about to go to way to college and i said harry i have something to tell you he's like what i'm like i'm gay he's like, well duh rose god i tell everyone that story i know yeah i knew you were gonna bring it up in this interview so. was coming out an important experience for you um well I didn't really necessarily come out in that kind of ritualistic fashion that I'm coming out to my family and friends and um, others. In fact, I remember it when I was 16, my mother said, I know you're gay. And I said, I know. And it was that no big deal. And in fact, this pin I'm wearing, I don't know if the camera can see it. It says, keep it gay. My mother got this for me when I was 16 when she was visiting New York City. So my mother was very supportive, 
but I was closeted as a track athlete in college. Um, that was 34 years ago. I wish I hadn't been closeted, but maybe it's because I was younger. But in terms of the coming out, I've been out for now 34 years, but there wasn't that kind of angst for me associated with coming out, but I was closeted. So that says something when I was in college. Growing up, were you aware of any LGBT, LGBTQ plus people um, in the media that you could look to? That's a good question. Um, Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres. I was 11, 10 or 11 when she came out on TV. And I remember, um, this is a fun story. I was hanging out with my friend, Justin, who was also gay. He moved away before we were in high school. Um, and so he went to a different school district. So I'm not totally sure how his experience was. Um, but we were, you know, 11 and 12 maybe, and we were hanging outside and, um, my mom came to pick me up and my mom and his dad were talking about the, the fact that Ellen was going to come out of the closet. And I, I remember thinking to myself, why was Ellen in the closet? Like, what, why did she go in the closet? Like, literally, what, why, why is she in the closet? Like, I don't understand. And, um, it wasn't until like a year or so later that I finally figured out what my parents were talking about. <laughs> Um, and so like, I, I was aware of Ellen and I figured out that she was gay eventually. Um, but I, she might've been one of the few. And I was driving and this friend of mine who was, who I know, I mean, I'd gone to school with and just, I mean, we just kind of, I don't know, we were just driving along and he, and he said, you know, there's something I want to tell you. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And he said, I just want to let you know that I'm gay. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the term he used. Uh, yeah, I'm almost certain it was. And he says, and I think you probably are too. And I mean, I just, I just couldn't even, I, you know, it, it was, it was weird is an understatement. I mean, it was just, it was, I was like the first, I mean, I didn't think that I was the only person in the world, but I mean, in fact, I was pretty sure of that, but I just did, had never, I never knew of anybody that was, that was gay. So... Uh, that was that was really weird. Well, then uh, shortly thereafter, I would say maybe a week or two after that. But he had been out, but again in Fort Wayne, not Huntington, um, for some time. And so then he took me to Fort Wayne and introduced me to a lot of of his gay friends. And back then, I mean, it was it was it was great. There are many things that my parents probably don't need to know, <laughs> even to this day. <laughs> I guess just um, reiterating a point I made, like role playing in general um, is more than just a creative outlet. I think it's been very, very good for me and also my friends and anyone who plays really to use as an opportunity to explore yourself. It's fun to take risks and try and push yourself out of your comfort zone because you'll never know what you find. Um, my first ever character was bisexual and I did it because I thought it would be an interesting thing to do. And I found out more about myself with that, that character. And I made a character that was trans uh, and I found out more about myself. And I'm not saying that's a universal. People aren't going to, you know, just discover everything about themselves through D, D characters or their <laughs> tabletop role-playing game of choice but it's a good way of looking at things from a different perspective whether that lens is on other people or yourself so you would say your identity is changed do you see your identity changing in the future or do you believe that right now you have it figured out I mean, honestly, it'll probably change in the future because I also thought I had it figured out in 12th grade year. And then I came to college and I met my boyfriend and I realized, wow, I'm not. And it's part of, and that's because your identity, your sexual identity is kind of fluid and it changes as life goes on because you don't got to be stuck in one mold for the rest of your life. You can always change. Is there anything you'd like to say to people who might watch this video in the future? So I kind of gave that spiel um, uh, two questions ago when I said, you know, the process of discovering oneself is a long one and it's never the same for anyone. Um, 
and so I guess I'll kind of combine it with D and D and with you know um, introspection on your on yourself, personality or otherwise. Um, it's going to be uncomfortable, and that's that pushes a lot of people away. But sometimes you know discomfort is what you need in order to move forward. So to anyone that is looking to, or, you know, thinks is thinking about discovering themselves through a, a stupid tabletop board game or <laughs> with something much more serious than that, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to feel like you don't know the answer to something because at the end of the day, the fact that you're even thinking about it means you're making progress towards learning more about yourself and it's learning about yourself that is the reward how is your ministry outside of working with Lutheran Church of the Cross and Grace Village impacted the Muncie LGBTQ community? Was there any other work beyond the churches that you've been doing? You know, um, I plug in because I, I know lots of folks in the community. I try to come alongside other projects that they're doing. You know, we try to, we try to go to some of the outreach fundraisers and be visible there. My wife and I, um, because my wife, um, is, is bisexual and you know repress that for a long time because of religion and so she really has a soft spot for outreach and helping you know those teenage kids understand that they're they're okay they're they're normal in all the right and wrong ways that all of us are normal right <laughs> and so um she's really passionate about that and so we we try to be visible for outreach as much as we can um I've been invited to to speak at some events downtown, and I've tried to do I've tried to do that uh, in ways that raise um, you know the visibility of our our acceptance and and affirmation in in just not even just my local churches, but in in our church body as a whole, and, and as the body of Christ as a whole to say, you know, th there is a home for you in the church, and so. If I'm invited, I should I try to show up, <laughs> like because it's just that important to me. Because I just feel like the church has been a sore spot for the LGBTQ community for a long time, and that's not that community's fault. It's it's been the church's fault, and so um, I just I just want to be an agent for for change and to help the church do better, even even in my imperfection and the ways I stumble and the ways that I don't get it right all the time. Um, I'm still learning and, and still hoping that, that people are patient with me so that I can continue to, to try to be a good friend and advocate. Mm -hmm. At the Grace Village, it's called God and Grub, is like the thing. It's every Monday night we meet and talk theology. Oh. So I find that interesting. And they also feed us, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can never complain about free food. Yes. <sighs> it's so <Okay>. true. <laughs> and they're actually... Um, God and Grub is actually very accepting of LGBTQ identities. And I find it very helpful when I see like other people sort of open up about their religious traumas almost. Mm -hmm. And they really help us like work through that and become like, like this is another translation that's like, um, that like affirms our current beliefs. Yeah. Instead of like talking down to us or saying we're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's pretty well known that there are a lot of churches or religious organizations out there who are, you know, very anti-gay or anti-LGBT. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, but do you think you've also experienced some that are not? Obviously, the one you just described. But um, do you think those are like becoming more common now? Oh, I feel like definitely. Like at least back home, I was not aware of any religious organizations that were like allies of the lgbtq community but here in muncie i know of at least two mm -hmm. i think that's cool yeah and they come into this world that's distinctly gendered so when a baby comes into this world it gets a little knit hat from a wonderful volunteer um, that's either blue or pink the hospital has balloons that are blue or pink or it's a boy it's a girl 
but we never exist and understand that some babies are born intersex. So there's no resources for babies that like have little purple hats or little purple balloons. And because of that, a lot of parents sometimes feel forced into surgical or healthcare decisions that choose one gender right after a baby is born that could impact that person for the rest of their lives. And in some ways, the gendered way in which hospitals and labor delivery departments are set up encourage that and encourage hasty decisions to reinforce a binary of gender. So I think it really, really opened my eyes when Reverend Kate Johnston spoke about the importance of this research and the importance of religious practitioners, including chaplains in these moments to walk in and say, unless your baby is, is having a health complication, unless they are dying or have a severe illness, this is a moment to cherish and pause and enjoy and remember. You don't have to make this hasty medical decision about potential surgeries that would compromise or affect the gender identity of your child in the future. Just enjoy and live in the moment. And I'm here to support your spiritual and emotional and moral needs in that time. So it really opened my eyes to just how multifaceted gender and LGBTQ plus identity is, um, but also the importance of religious people working in all of these spaces. I never would have thought of a chaplain coming in during a, a, an, an episode of delivery or coming into a delivery room or, or being with a woman during labor. I asked him, so are, is this an open and affirming congregation? And of course, I always had to explain what that meant. Um, and he would sit there and they would go, oh, I don't know. And I go, one of the things I told you all to do was to get a bulletin. The bulletin will tell us everything we need to know about this congregation. Everything gender roles, for instance, what they believe. I mean, it's amazing what's there through their announcements and how they lay things out and everything. What did that bulletin say? Oh, I don't know. Nothing, doesn't say anything. I said, what's on the front of that bulletin? And on the front of that bulletin, in the middle of the page, it says, we are an open and affirming congregation. <laughs> and, oh, and it was like, it's right there. It's right there. It's plain and simple and clear, you know? Um, they, and they just like right over their heads. Um, but uh, so if you ever go anywhere to a religious service, read that entire bulletin. You will know everything you need to know about that congregation. It's amazing how much you can learn about that congregation um, just by what they do and how they print it up and how they communicate that. So, you know, we've got the websites and we've got the bulletins, maybe even Facebook, and we can find out who's open and affirming um, and whether they really mean that. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's the only resource. I mean, you get there and you may find, oh, there's some pamphlets here and there. Oh, somebody might say, hey, did you read such and such? Or, uh, um, and, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, the, the Unitarian Universalist has a magazine, you know, it comes from Boston. You should read that. There's lots of good stuff in there. Uh, I was like, eh, you don't need any of that. What you need is people. And if the people are authentic in their beliefs and they're being genuine with you, they're honest, transparent, and that's all you need. You mentioned the Pride Parade for this past year. What was that supposed to look like? And who was behind that coming into almost being during the COVID-19 pandemic? So the big organizer was Stephen Nip, And I know that Laura Janney, who is one of the primary folks at Outreach, was helping him with that. And it went through a lot of different leadership changes. So I don't, I can't speak with any real certainty, but I was told at one point um, they were going to invite people from affirming churches to um, stand near where, like, uh, they were they were planning that people would be there to counter protest, right? They were planning on people yes. to, be there to try to disrupt, and so I think in those cases, there's always like a place set up for counter protesters, right? I think uh, you'll see that in a lot of pride events. You know, the 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 hell hell and brim, fire and brimstone people show up and they're not just allowed to wander, you know, where they might be a threat to other people. And so 
one of the early ideas that was proposed to me was that us from the affirming churches in town would have the opportunity to kind of be a wall between the pride parade and the the um, hurtful people. And so that was something I was uh, glad to do. I think it's okay for me to be gay, and I think God will still love me for being gay. And I think that um, if his greatest commandment is love, then why not love myself and then allow others to love me and spread that kind of, you know, um, thing. And the kind of re recurring mantra that I give myself for that kind of, you know, if I read something about, you know, anti-LGBT from the Christian community, I'm like, love wins is, is my kind of mantra. So, and that kind of ties in with um, both, you know, just love winning uh, with Christ from the grave, um, love winning in, you know, me accepting myself, being kind to myself, um, because there's so much. Um I think an LGBTQ center would be actually the best thing for the LGBTQ community here at Ball State and elsewhere. We could bring in speakers, we could have parties, we could have a safe space for LGBTQ students. Actually, to be honest, I think all oppressed groups should have their, don't forget the cards here, I think all oppressed groups should have their own spaces um, for celebration of culture, identity, and to create community. I don't want to like say like, oh, I hope we don't have to talk about it or I hope that like, um, I don't really want to say that because I hope that it's something that like people who aren't directly impacted by it, like I hope it's something that is so important to them that they would uh, educate themselves on. And I hope that it's like just so integrated into um, future education. And um, cause I don't think it's ever going to be something that's like, oh, like you don't have to, we don't have to talk about, oh, this person's gay, this person's trans, because I think that's like kind of falls along the lines of, of like being colorblind to race. Um, I think just acknowledging those differences and being educated enough to um, not worry about being politically correct, but just caring for each other and um, admiring the beauty of those differences that the LGBT community has. The future for me is basically just becoming more comfortable with myself. Um, I've been, uh, I've been, you know, in my transition for over a year now, and I am 11 months on um, what's called HRT, hormone replacement therapy, a combination of different medicines that, you know, physically alter my body to um, make it more comfortable for how I wish to express myself. Um, if like, you know, um, if it were possible, I'd show some old photos of myself because I look absolutely nothing like how I used to even just a year ago. Um, but it's, I'm looking forward to the next few years of doing this. Needless to say, like, I'm in the process of growing my hair out and um, making a new wardrobe without going bankrupt because that's a lot of money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and being, you know, being six foot one, uh, some things are hard to find, but yeah, for the future, it's basically just me being more comfortable with myself, being able to express myself more comfortably in a public setting and just, you know, being happy. Um, everything about this has been a roller coaster of emotions on like a daily basis still, but it's definitely the happiest I've ever been in my life. And I'm looking forward to continuing that. I have two things to say for two different people. One, if people are more accepting and positive in the future, just be happy that you are where you're at. And I'm glad that maybe I could have been some sort of step to that brighter future. If the future doesn't get any brighter and it in fact gets worse, um, I want you to know that there is still a chance to fight and there is always a chance to push back and 
I've watched beliefs burn in and out. You know, you being a history major, you know how how it is to watch the the time change and, and the beliefs change and the systems change, but there's one thing that doesn't change, and that is the human spirit. It's very hard to crush. It's extremely hard to crush. And so things aren't working out in the future. I just hope that that spirit is still strong. <laughs>